Artlaw TV presents Art and Appropriation. When does artistic freedom become copyright infringement? My interest in Morris started originally when I came back from America where I had been working with American Midwest fabrics, cowboy and Indian fabrics. I wanted to do something English and I was thinking, I, I can't go and work with American fabrics, it's not my culture, I can't get hold of the fabrics anyway, I'm not there anymore. Like what's around me, what would be quintessentially English, like part of my culture? And I thought, William Morris. But I also knew about William Morris because I'd read E.P. Thompson's from Romantic to Revolutionary a few years before and I was more aware of William Morris as a, a revolutionary. I mean that book is about um, Morris's trajectory if you like from being a liberal to being interested in socialism and reformism and his dabbling in anarchism and setting up the first um, socialist movements in Britain in the in mid to the uh, 19th century and I began to think about the fabrics as being political entities and looking at the fabrics what happens is you're very aware that it's always sunny, it's always summer. The representations in the, the fabrics, it's, everything's always in leaf, it's always in flower or in fruit. And what you never see is a representation of winter, where you just see twigs, where you just see like... But it's about a utopian image, really. So, I mean, some of the first paintings I did with Morris was to strip out the utopianism by painting around the twigs and painting out with white paint or black paint, painting out all the fruit and the flowers and the leaves and just leaving twigs. In this way, David Mab is not copying Morris's work. He uses it in a different way to that intended. Copying takes place when works such as fruit twigs are reproduced in publications or websites. Clearly, Morris died more than 70 years ago, so therefore copyright would have expired, and anyone would be free, therefore, to use as a starting point those works uh, and play around with them. And indeed, in the case of Morris, um, the wallpaper or the prints uh, and so on, probably copyright law at the time was very limited, if not uh, irrelevant, because... Morris entered into the manufacturing industrial process where even today copyright law is almost non-effective. And also Morris fabrics, you know, because he died in, oh, I think it was 1896, um, they're out of copyright because it's 70 years since the death of the author or artist. So all of his work is, you know, publicly available. I can do what I want with it without getting into trouble. So now I, whenever I appropriate anything and I appropriate different images to be painted over the Morris, I always think, hmm, can I use this? Copyright law would say that if you create a work of which you say is your own, but the image taking say a painting for example, uh, the image you create is substantially derived from somebody else's earlier work so that the image you create mainly looks like, it may not be exactly the same as, but looks like the work, uh, the shape, form, configuration, colours, lines of somebody else's earlier work, then it's likely to be that there has been a violation of copyright if that earlier work is a work made by an artist who died less than 70 years ago or is still alive. Glenn Brown's work, originally titled The Loves of Shepherds 2000, was the subject of an infringement claim brought by Tony Roberts in relation to his earlier illustration. When you put the two works side by side, the images look more than strikingly similar. You can see that one is derived from the other. It's obvious. Artistically, there are lots of differences with oil paint being used, brush strokes, all that kind of stuff. But to the lay eyes, they were cousins. They were brother and sister, if you see what I mean. And the problem is that artistically, Brown will argue, I'm sure, that there is a world of difference between the two and his intention was very different and so on and so forth. But I think the law would probably be used successfully 
by somebody like Anthony Roberts to say, no, you're making a work and exploiting economically my original image in the work that, that you've made. The case settled before it went to court and Glenn Brown agreed to change the title of the work. In the early 1990s, David Mab used copies of Magnum photographs as a starting point for his work. So I was frustrated and fascinated with the notion of realism, the way photography represents the world, but on the other hand, being aware that it's a total construct. And so I started overpainting them and deleting parts of the photograph. And I was going to show them at a gallery called Camera Work, which was in the East End in the early 1990s. And the director of, that was the curator of the gallery, she um, thought it would be wise to seek copyright permission. And all the, I'd actually got a book um, of Magnum photos, and they were all Magnum photos, the ones I'd overpainted. So we went down to Magnum, the offices in London, and were naively, as it turned out, we were going to ask them for copyright permission. And our main aim was to get this on the cheap by claiming that we, you know, we were an educational institution and therefore we, didn't want, we hadn't got a lot of money and basically could we make a token payment. And in the nicest possible way, they um, turned around and accused me of stealing their photographs and um, asked us to leave <laughs> after giving us a cup of tea. But, um, and two days later, uh, a letter came from their lawyers um, indicating that they would prosecute the gallery for copyright infringement if we went ahead and exhibited the work. The main legal concern from the gallery's point of view would be, is the work being exposed for sale? Because it is ordinarily a criminal copyright offence to exhibit infringing copyright works for sale. So we're trying to think of a way around this and what we decided to do was to exhibit the work covered um, with black fabric as though they were censored, in a way they were censored. And next to the work was going to be, or there was, a text describing the work that you couldn't see that was behind the black fabric. So you couldn't see the, the work that you were looking at and it said we weren't able to show this work because we didn't get copyright permission from, from Magnum. And I've used a lot of Russian constructivist imagery, like Popova, I mean, she died, I think, in 26, so she's probably out of copyright, although I don't know what the law is in Russia. I'm just applying what I know here. And so, yes, it always now it's like a second recourse to think, can I use this? Is it going to be a problem? If someone asks me in the gallery, have I got copyright permission? It's always at the back of my mind now to, in how I make choices. You know, when, I think when I'm making art, the idea of getting permissions before you even start sort of indicates a way of working whereby you know what exactly you're going to do even before you do it. And as an artist, I don't work like that. Um, making art for me is much more exploratory, sort of intuitive. I'm making things up as I'm going along and I change my mind all the time in, through the process of working. What seems like legitimate artistic practice can amount to infringement. Artists need to understand when copyright exists and how it's infringed. For further details of this programme and other programmes by Artlaw TV, please go to www.artquest.org.uk.